Okay, so today, uh, as you can see here, we're going to continue with uh, looking at um, some close readings of Here Bullet, Brian Turner's uh, collection of poetry, um, some of it uh, autobiographical, of sort of recounting his time uh, at war in Iraq uh, in 2003. Uh, so war poetry, I think really what I want to harp on and underscore here is the idea of war poetry, and we touched upon this in the last lecture, but war poetry uh, is a subgenre. We think about poetry as a genre of writing, uh, of fiction, of creativity, of the craft of writing. Then think of war poetry as a subgenre of poetry, its own genre, its own sort of earmark uh, within the grander scheme of writing. So it, this, it falls into a tradition of war and the purveyors of war, soldiers, sailors, marines, as poets a witness. We touched upon that before in the last class, but it's it's important idea and concept within Here Bullet, the idea that Brian Turner was a, a poet of witness. And that is to say, uh, he had firsthand uh, contact and knowledge of uh, the actions and even the atrocities of war. Uh, so in keeping with that idea, with the concept of war poetry uh, as a subgenre of a larger genre of poetry itself, we'll look at a number of poets uh, today from past eras who went to war came back like Brian Turner uh, and cast into words uh, what they witnessed while in, in the theater of war. Uh, and just as a quick note too, uh, I've used this, I think we used this disclaimer for my last uh, lecture as well, but I've used this lecture uh, in a prior class. So uh, if you see any weird dates or if I say anything like, oh, this is due Tuesday or something crazy like that or May 2nd, uh, just disregard it please because it's been used in a prior class. And uh, But I've changed the first uh, a, mo a few minutes of the lecture, and I changed the last few minutes to catch us up to our own uh, class. So uh, without any further ado, we're going to look at a number of poets from the past and compare and contrast them to uh, Here Bullet. Okay, we have two poems here, uh, O Captain, My Captain by Walt Whitman uh, and The Odes of Solomon. Uh, both of these I would put into the genre, the subgenre. Well, first, O Captain, My Captain, the subgenre of um, of war poetry. And Odes of Solomon, Not, not it's not... In that same genre, of course, uh, it's more sort of a biblical slant, uh, but it does adhere in a way and connect in a way to Walt Whitman's poem, O Captain, My Captain. So let's take a look at that. So I'll just read the beginning of O Captain, My Captain. O Captain, My Captain. O Captain, My Captain, our fearful trip is done. The ship has weathered every rack. The prize we sought is won. The port is near. The bells I hear. The people all exulting. While follow, wild follow eyes, the steady keel. The vessel grim and daring, but oh heart, 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 oh the bleeding drops of red, where on the deck my captain lies, fallen down, cold and dead. Oh captain, my captain, rise up and hear the bells, rise up for the flag is flung, for the bugle trills, for the bouquets and ribbon wreaths, for you the shores a crowding, for you they call, the swaying mass, their eager faces turning, here captain, dear captain, or sorry, dear father, this arm beneath your head, it is some dream on the deck. You've fallen cold, you're, you've fallen cold and dead. Okay, so I'm not going to read the rest of it. You can read it at your leisure. Uh, a testament and even a celebration of a fallen president, in this case, Abraham Lincoln, who, as you probably know, was the U.S. president uh, who saw the beginning and eventual end to the Civil War in America. Uh, Walt Whitman, nicknamed the Bard of Democracy, so the Bard is sort of a reference, an allusion uh, to Shakespeare, the Bard, who was nicknamed the Bard, is using a specific type of poetry to exalt a very public figure. A uh, part of the structural elements of this poem is the use of O, O Captain, which changes, interestingly enough, uh, from the O, O H in the poem's title, which is spelled O H. Part of the reasoning uh, behind O is its ability to celebrate this nation's fallen father. We see that mirrored in the ode, the, a very specific type of poetry called ode, right? The official definition of ode is a single unified strain of exalted lyric a verse directed to a single purpose and dealing with one theme. One of the distinctions of an O2 is the use of O, sort of a signal word that what you're about to hear or read is going to exalt or celebrate some place, something, or someone. In this case, it's a person, Abraham Lincoln. You can see that in the second century poem, Ode of Solomon, uh, an ancient text, where the Lord is exalted with the repetition of O Lord. So we get O Captain, um, and then on the right-hand side with the Odes of Solomon, we get the O Lord one, two, three or four times, four times. So exalting, celebrating, uh, 
putting on a pedestal, uh, an individual for whatever reason, in this case, the Lord on the right side and the left side, what would have been the Lord or father of the United States at the time, Abraham Lincoln. This very specific type, it's going to, we're going to see this again uh, later on um, in this, in this lecture, the idea of, of, of exalting or celebrating is a specific type of poetry. Let's go ahead and look in the next poem. Okay, here we have another poem, uh, World War I, uh, Futility by Wilfred Owen, a famous World War I poet. So Wilfred Owen was a WW1 uh, world, uh, soldier and poet who eventually died in battle. Let's go ahead and read the poem, Futility. Move him into the sun. Gently, its touch awoke him once, at home, whispering of fields half sown. Always it woke him, even in France, until this morning and this snow. If anything might rouse him now, the kind old sun will know. Think how it wakes the seeds, woke once the clays of a cold star. Our limbs to dear achieved, so dear achieved, our sides, our sides, full nerved, still warm, too hard to stir. What is it for this the clay grew tall? Oh, what made fatuous sunbeams toil to break or sleep at all? Okay, his writing, although it's in verse, uh, reminds me of Randall Jarrell's and Stark and his stark treatment of the human condition here. Much in the same way we read uh, Death of the Balter Gunner, where when he died, quote, they washed him out of his uh, with a hose, unquote. Owen is moving a dead or at least soon to die body into the sun before moving to the second stanza where, like Whitman, he's allowing the speaker to celebrate or exalt this life giving object, in this case, the sun, solidified in the final line of the poem. Oh, what made Fatchwood sunbeams toil? To break earth sleep at all so you certainly can start to see a relationship and even a tradition uh, that emerges between owen and later jarrell with their treatment of the dead a poetic treatment adopted too by brian turner and here boy interesting here too uh is the use of the word fatuous something being silly or pointless towards the end of the poem uh, a word that is echoed back to the poem's title futility uh, something that's pointless in this instance what is fatuous what is futile within the poem the direct and easy answer would be the human element of the poem, the hymn in the opening stanza, move him into the sun. The hymn the speaker wants to give life to by moving into the sun, um, a thing to celebrate due to its ability to provide life, despite its inability or futility to do so in this instance. The soldier of this, the soldier or Marine uh, of this poem will die. Okay, it's hard to speak about um, war poetry um, especially in modern times, in modern wars, <clears throat> such as Vietnam, without speaking about uh, the author Yusuf Komanyaka, especially quintessential of his writing is Facing It. So let's go ahead and read this. Facing It. My black face fades, hiding inside the black granite. I said I wouldn't. Damn it. No tears. I'm stone. I'm flesh. My clouded reflection eyes me, like a bird of prey, the profile of night slanted against morning. I turn. This way, the stone lets me go. I turn that way, I'm inside. The Vietnam Veterans Memorial again, depending on the light to make a difference. I go down to 58,022 names, half expecting to find my own in letters like smoke. I touch the name Andrew Johnson. I see the booby trap's white flash. Names shimmer on a woman's blouse. But when she walks away, the names stay on the wall. Brush strokes flash. A red bird's wings cutting across my stair. The sky, a plane in the sky. A white vet's image floats closer to me. When his pale eyes look through mine, I'm a window. He's lost his right arm inside the stone. In the black mirror, a woman's trying to erase names. No, she's brushing a boy's hair. So, wow, powerful poem. A lot of great imagery. Notice the use of also Komenyak is accessing birds the way we see a great deal. We're going to talk about this tomorrow in the next lecture on the 14th. But he's talking about birds uh, within his poem that Brian Turner echoes the same thing. He talks a lot about birds within Here Bullet. Uh, uses bird imagery, bird action, uh, bird perching, birds viewing, as almost as we spoke about before, as sort of it being the observation, it being the poet of witness, um, accessing those birds. Uh, as some figure to push forward the idea of a poetry of witness. So Facing It uh, is a poem by American poet and author Yusef Komanyaka. It is a reflection on Komanyaka's first visit to the Vietnam Veterans Memorial. Uh, Komanyaka served in Vietnam and was discharged from the Army in 1966 
during which time he wrote for the army newspaper called Southern Cross. It is the second poem written by Komiaka about Vietnam. Poet R.S. Gwynn has referred to the poem as the most poignant elegy that has been written about the Vietnam War. I think that's great characterization by Gwynn, but what exactly is an elegy? Well, if the ode celebrates, the elegy's sole occupation is to mourn. A proper de definition of the poetic form of elegy is a sustained formal poem setting forth meditations on death or another solemn theme. The meditation, think of that as what the poem is most concerned with, often is occasioned by the death of a particular person, but it may be generalized observations or the expression of a solemn mood. In this way, I think Kalmanyaka is meditating on this war memorial and is also elegizing, that is to say, mourning the death of the boy, the poet and narrator alike are facing it. They're facing death. Vis on vis, the woman who's attempting to erase names and all other visitors to the monument are doing the same. Again, like Turner's PFC Miller, uh, in his poem titled, aptly enough, Elegy, um, Kumanyaka is being both specific and general. Specific in the sense that we get an actual soldier or Marine's name, Andrew Johnson, something we spoke about earlier uh, with regard to postmodern's tendency to obliterate grand or meta narratives, always bringing it back to the individual. In this case, the individual name, uh, Andrew Johnson. And in Turner's case, PFC Miller. In general, however, Kumanyaka is going against that idea by accessing a very common last name uh, with Johnson, as if to show that everyone who has lost their lives, no matter what creed, background, or lineage, or even branch of service, uh, should be part and parcel with the testament of this type of monument, as well as this elegy. I wish I could say the structure of this poem, how it is in nearly, or two nearly equal stanzas, is mimetic of the actual Vietnam um, monument and memorial. It's not, however, I had to split the, the, the poem, which is one long stanza, uh, into two, just to fit the slide. Okay, let's go ahead and read uh, Autopsy uh, by Brian Turner. Autopsy. Staff Sergeant Garza, the mortuary affairs specialist from Missouri, switches on the music to hear, there's a long black cloud hanging in the sky, honey, as she slices out a Y incision with a scalpel, from collarbone to breastplate, from the xiphoid process down the smooth skin of the belly, bringing light into the great cavern of the body. In the deep flesh, where she cuts the cords which bind the heart, Lifting it in her gloved palms, weighing and measuring the organ, she can't help but imagine how fast it beat when he first kissed Shauna Allen, or how it became heavy with whiskey, and what humbled him. What Garza holds in her hands, 34 years of life, will be given in ash to the earth and sea, if we're lucky, by someone like her, singing low at the chorus, there's a long black cloud hanging in the sky, weather's gonna break, and hell's gonna fly, baby, sweet thing, Darlin. Okay, uh, within the poem Autopsy, we are actually taking, uh, taken to a scene where an autopsy is literally taking place. Turner handles what could be a gruesome moment with grace and ease and astonishing poetics, if you think about it. Think of bringing, a, quote, bringing light into the great cavern of the body in the deep flesh where she cuts the cords which bind the heart and relating the heart to various experiences that dead soldier would have faced during his lifetime, both the good and the bad moments. I think Turner's being sophisticated here too with some of the language is double meaning. Uh, think of the fourth line as she slices out a lie incision with a scalpel and the tension that exists between the black imagery of the poem and the light of it. He does this throughout his collection. One could easily write an essay on that, the binary opposition of light and dark. Uh, we have the, inter the uh, have to interpret the Y incision as literal, an actual cut, across the man's chest in a Y formation in order to perform an autopsy. Uh, but the Y incision is also reminiscent of the speaker allowing Staff Sergeant Garza to pose a question. Why? Why do I have to continue to perform this horrendous act in order to discover the cause of these soldiers' death? Finally, we also get the attestation of postmodernity in the very specific use of the person's name here, Staff Sergeant Garza. The idea of postmodernism, right, drilling down on the individual in this world, unlike Jarrell and Owen before him, who are practitioners of modern poetry, of modernity, not post-modernity, and therefore fail to mention specific names in the death of the Baltimore gunner uh, and futility, as well as protocols, where they are perpetuating grand or meta-narratives, Turner, in a post-modern stroke, is obliterating them. Okay, let's go ahead and read uh, Repatriation Day. And we have the epigraph here, uh, Shalom Cha at the Iran-Iraq border, Repatriation Day. The skeletons rest in their boxes, still slack-jawed 20 years later, as if amazed at their own deaths. I want to lie down among them, to be wrapped in sheets like flags of nations, banded in light and shadow. 
I want the Red Cross workers to lean over so I can see the tired look in their eyes as she writes down my name. Okay, so fairly short poem, three stanzas, each with three lines, what's called tercets, right? Two is couplets, three is tercets, uh, four is quatrain. Okay, in Turner's poem, he's accessing events from the past, in this case, events that had taken place in Iraq, Iran border town. Shalamacha is a town located in Kuzakhstan province, Iran. It is situated on the border with Iraq, northwest of Abadan. The town is one of the main sites of invasion of Saddam Hussein's Iraq in the Iraq-Iran war. Some 50,000 Iranians died in the fighting around the town, and there is today a war memorial in their memory. Here again, by accessing an artifact from the past, such as this war, Turner is pulling us into the instability of this region of the past and present even. So we get the Iraq-Iran war, and he's accessing and connecting it with the Iraq war of the present, at least in the present back then of 2003-2004. An interesting point of view uh, for the speaker here too, whereby Turner is allowing the dead to speak again by using the eye point of view, as we could see in the third tercet. You get, we get, I want the Red Cross to, worker to lean over so I can see that tired look in her eyes as she writes my name down, or down my name. Repatriation, then, is the idea of the speaker being reintroduced to their native country, also made apparent in the use of the imagery of the speaker wanting to be, quote, wrapped in sheets like flags uh, of nations banned in light and shadow. Turner's using the binary opposition of light and dark here, too, most likely to deliver the opposing tension of this land, its leader, in the past and present conflicts. All right, so here we have, I wanted to talk about Najaf, 1820. Let's go ahead and read it, and then we'll speak uh, about uh, some strong points. Najaf, 1820. Camel caravans transport the dead from Persia and beyond, their bodies dried and wrapped in carpets, their dying wishes to be buried near Ali, where the first camel dragged Ali's body across the desert, tied to the fate of its exhaustion. Najaf is where the dead naturally go, where the gates of paradise open before them in unbanded light, the blood washed clean from their bodies. It is November, the clouds made of gunpowder and rain, the earth pregnant with the dead, cemetery mounds stretching row by row with room enough to yet for what the years will bring. The grave diggers need only dig, shovel by shovel. Wow, some interesting language within this poem. I just wanted to lecture on the one poem because it has a strong poetic line, such as unbanded light. Notice he used banded light in the last poem. So he's tinkering with this idea of banded light, unbanded light, light in general versus dark. Had he only mentioned light and never used any dark imagery or words that are just by the very nature uh, reminiscent of dark, if you just use light, it still begs the question of dark because of the binary opposition. But here Turner is incorporating light balanced against the concept of death or darkness and the quote, clouds made of gunpowder and ray. What an evocative image. And quote, earth pregnant with the dead. How haunting and macabre that image is. So vivid in the idea of mounds of graves, or sorry, mounds as graves protruding uh, from the earth as if she were pregnant. So he's got some really interesting imagery going on here. Okay, final poem we're talking about today in Turner's Ferris Wheel. Let's go ahead and take, listen to it. The opening stand, or here we go, uh, Ferris Wheel. And he has a, a epigraph here as well, Asadir Taurus Complex, Mosul, Iraq. So what's the point of the, of the epigraph, right? He's given us a geographical location. He's given us more information that he's not going to ne mention necessarily within the poem itself, right? So he's, he's, he's layering the information that he's delivering to us. Do we need it? Do we need to be geographically positioned to understand the, uh, the complexity of the poem? What it's attempting to communicate? It's a, it's a large question that needs to be sort of addressed, and maybe there isn't an answer for it. But let's go ahead and read it and see if we can sort of address that. Ferris wheel. A helicopter went down in the river last night, hitting a power line slung a few feet off the water. They were searching for survivors, survivors and bodies from a boat. Capsized earlier, Americans and Iraqis both. It's dawn now, and the sky drifts low and flat and cold. The way search boats on the Tigris drift further and further down river. When Navy divers bring up the body of an Iraqi policeman, it will be a man we aren't searching for, and still another, later in the day, a college student from Kirkuk. It will be a long week of searching, like this, Every morning near the shoreline, restaurant where open fires are fed, kindling and tender, a cook's hands lifting the silver bodies of fish, weighing them on scales. The history books will get it wrong. There will be nothing written 
about the island Ferris wheel, frozen by rust like a broken clock, or about the pilot floating unconscious downriver, sparks fading above as his friend swam toward him, instead of the shore, how both would drown in this cold, unstoppable river. Wow. So the opening stanza, and even most of the poem itself, is almost journalistic in nature, the way it's structured, tempered from any emotion even. In this way, Turner is allowing the scene to be more objective, not allowing the speaker or actions within the poem to emote or, fear so or feel sorrow for themselves. Uh, there is both a literal Ferris wheel within the poem, but also the metaphorical, how war, instability, transgression is an endless wheel, a poignant commentary on the human condition, I should think. What's interesting here, too, is the imagery of the broken clock. So this Ferris wheel, it, it, it in and of itself stands for something. It's symbolic of something. As we spoke about before, war being endless, part of the human condition. But a broken clock, as if time had stopped on this, during this moment, only to perpetuate itself forever. Okay. Um, as you can see here, I uh, have a YouTube video. Uh, it's a Brian Turner interview where he reads from here bullets, all these interesting and evocative and um, timely uh, that we listen to the poet, especially if they're contemporary and there's footage of them. Read their own work so we can sort of understand uh, what the voice is uh, and the tone and the delivery. Um, and the meaning, the inflection uh, that Brian Turner would place on certain words, how he would respect the, the end stop or the white space and the sejuros. Uh, and as always, please email me if you have any questions or concerns uh, at any time. Um, I'm always open to that. And also, um, the Here Bullet open ended question number three is due in Blackboard on October 29th. I'll email instructions for that on that morning. So look out for that email uh, where you get the link uh, and instructions on posting uh, your. your um, open-ended question uh, and just a reminder all grades uh, should be caught up uh, by me so I would have graded them and posted a blackboard by next class uh, so look out for that and uh, let me know if you have any questions guys thanks for listening to the lecture talk to you later bye